Matters TV. I'm your co-host, Paul Mitchell, Vice President of First Cornerstone Bank in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Joining me this evening is Patricia Dunn, Senior Vice President and Head of Dunn Group in West Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Welcome, Good to see you. Patricia. Thanks for joining us this evening. So, lots happening out there in the investment markets. It's been quite a time. In international, <laughs> domestically, different uh, segments, uh, energy, um, currencies. What are you advising your clients these days, Patricia? Well, the uh, let's go to the currencies to start there. Uh, it has been really an interesting roller coaster. As you know, when the EU came out with their currency, it started out at parity with our dollar. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it dropped, which made it very inexpensive for Americans to travel to Europe. Then, of course, it's climbed, and now it's quite expensive to go to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're starting to see it drop a little, so it's okay. getting a little good, bit good. less expensive. But then add the fact that Scotland's uh, looking to become independent. Who would have, who would have guessed? So um, it's interesting to see what that might do to the currency, particularly the pound versus the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting to see something like, like a, a country um, seceding, if, if you will. Um, there's other talk about other situations within the, uh, the Euro uh, uh, markets regarding, um, you know, whether it's Greece or Portugal or Italy, also secede, seceding or le leaving the EU for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, to see something, a combination like that uh, being that fragile, I guess it's disconcerting. But what's the impact on the um, U.S. Uh, stock market? Well, the U.S. stock market's been quite strong. So the U.S. stock market is driven by earnings, and the mm -hmm. earnings have been quite good. But uh, our European counterparts, eh, they're not bringing as much to the party, but mm -hmm. we keep expecting them to, because a lot of your European stocks are where our stocks were back in 2009. Hmm. So eventually, they have to come to the party. Mm -hmm. So you're steering your clients into international markets? We believe in diversified portfolio, so we have something in every pot. Mm -hmm. to make sure, because as you know, we don't know what tomorrow's headline is going to be. Yeah. So diversification is what you need to be doing in mm -hmm. order to protect yourself right now. Right, right. Well, you know, this recession you, you referenced uh, is, seems to be, in many ways, way behind us. So there's still some aspects such as unemployment, which are of concern. Um, and some people even say, well, maybe we should start looking at the next impending recession. What are your thoughts around that? That's a very interesting point. Uh, I believe that the next bubble that we'll see, and I can't tell you when, but uh, the next bubble we're going to see is going to be in fixed income. Because interest rates are a very simple animal. They go up, they go down, they stay the same. Mm -hmm. We came down for 30 years. We've been level for four or five years. You don't go into negative numbers in interest rates. So the only thing left is to go up. And, of course, they're already talking about that at the Fed. And when that starts to go up, bond prices go down. Mm -hmm. And bonds have been a place where investors have been hiding for quite some time. Because they're safe? Because they're perceived to be safe. Mm -hmm. And they are safe in declining interest rate environment and a flat interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. They are not so safe in a rising interest rate environment. And I think a lot of... Uh, the next shock wave is going to be like, oh, my bonds went down. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the next bubble that we're going to see. Okay, but it's not going to be such a big bu burst bu bubble as we experienced a few oh. years ago. Uh, they're hoping not. Uh, I, was, I was managing money mm -hmm. back in the late 70s, early 80s, and I saw bonds go to 50 cents on the dollar. Wow. Uh, they're saying this time they don't think it's going to be quite that dramatic mm -hmm. because all of the other features around the bonds have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, baby boomers were entering the market in big numbers back yeah. there in the late 70s, early 80s. They were getting jobs. They were buying mm -hmm. homes. They were buying cars. They were buying this. You had this drive. There was so much energy going on. And inflation went up. We don't have that now. We have a lackluster economy with high unemployment. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a lot to drive inflation up. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's going to hurt. Inflation has to go up as mm -hmm. interest rates go up. But I'm thinking it'll be maybe less painful than it was in the late 70s, early mm -hmm. 80s. 
Time will tell. Yeah. Talking about boomers and generations at all, um, I look at the, the millennials um, and, and uh, people's uh, investments in their homes, which traditionally, at least the last 40 or 50 years, has been the best investment. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have become disenchanted in, in recent years. Do you see any changes in that? People saying, well, okay, I'm going to go back into believing that my, my house is my most important investment and I'll move back out of the apartment and, and buy a house? I don't. Uh, they do say real estate is recovering. Uh, they do say that rents are going up. But once we start seeing interest rates rise again and mortgages getting more expensive, mm -hmm. uh, that hurts. And really, until we can get the first time home buyers back in the game, you can't get movement further up the ladder. Yeah. And we're not there yet. The first time home, bur bur first time home owners many of them are still renting mm -hmm. or they're trapped in homes that they bought in 05 and 06 yeah. whose value hasn't caught back up to what they paid for it. Mm -hmm. So really, I, I would keep an eye on the entry level homes. When you mm -hmm. start seeing them pick up, mm -hmm. that's when you're going to see a recovery in real estate. Mm -hmm. So maybe now would be the time to buy. Definitely. Low interest rates, d depressed value still, catch that catch that wave. If you've got the money to buy real estate now, I think it is a buyer's market uh, because yes, once the interest rates start going up, it's going mm -hmm. to be harder to get a mortgage. Yeah. Let's talk about something else that uh, I know affects the, uh, the markets and in, uh, industry in general, energy. You know, we've had this great boom in natural gas in uh, Western Pennsylvania and uh, other parts of the country. Do you see that continuing? Uh, to, uh, is there a, a real, a real uh, independent, uh, U.S. independence uh, an energy um, coming yes. that'll, that'll drive the economy? Yes, very much so. We have been an energy dependent country since you and I were born and probably before. And we are seeing a demographic change that we have never seen before. We're going to go from energy dependent to energy sufficient to energy exporting. Can My you goodness. imagine what that's going to do to the mm -hmm. economy? Mm -hmm. This is one of several trends that speaks well for the stock market going forward. Mm -hmm. So this is all positive. Okay. Talk about big trends. What's the latest thing with China? I mean, uh, China supposedly uh, almost decimated our industry. You know, everything's being made over, over offshore. Uh, all kinds of uh, sort of uh, suspicious trade practices and currency practice and that type of thing. Is the bloom off the rose in China, or is that still something that uh, we have to be concerned about and de dependent on? I wouldn't say the bloom is quite off the rose, but let's say it's fading a bit. Their growth rate has substantially slowed down. They have a pollution problem that is extreme, and they're only starting to get their arms around it. I would say cautiously optimistic about China. Mm -hmm. How about other, other parts of the world, like, like Mexico and the other places that uh, we have uh, goods manufactured and are buying from? I'm not that familiar with the Latin American. Mm -hmm. uh, I think really more of the thrust is going to be towards Europe. And I would look to blue chip companies in Europe to find more growth. Uh, I'm just seeing that more on the horizon than mm -hmm. I am seeing Latin America mm -hmm. at this time. Okay. Uh, blue chip companies like uh, some of these wine companies in, uh, in France and Italy or, or Spain? <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak to individual companies. But industries. <laughs> but uh, but it, it is interesting uh, seeing what's happening there. And uh, I don't know whether it'll come from the wine or whether it'll come from the technology. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess if I had to uh, uh, make a broad guess, I would say I would take a look at the end, industry and technology mm -hmm. before I take okay. a look at wine. Okay. Well, we certainly are a global economy now, so I think the, what I'm hearing is that uh, we should keep our eyes open not only domestically, but uh, the parts uh, around the world. Exactly. Now, we have a question from a, um, a viewer. This question comes from Robert Thornton in Parksburg, Pennsylvania. I believe that's uh, west of Paoli. I think it's the end of the line. It is. The R5. Mr. Thornton asks, do you have any good uh, tax-efficient um, investment strategies? All right, yes, Mr. Thornton, there's a lot out there. And uh, my recommendation would be to focus on the vehicle first. 
rather than the investment itself. And if you are still employed, I would say the first and most tax efficient way to save is through your company's 401k plan. And many companies match some of your contributions. Uh, unfortunately, you have a lot of people to say, well, I'm only going to contribute up to the match and not do anything more than that. And I think that's foolish. Mm -hmm. I think you should absolutely uh, take the maximum advantage of your 401k plan. It goes in pre-tax and it grows tax deferred. Yeah, that is the ultimate in tax efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now, some 401 plans are sophisticated enough that they have a Roth option. If your company has a Roth option, I would highly encourage you to contribute to the Roth portion of your 401k. But be smart about it. Make sure you have a Roth account outside of your company 401k, because remember, there is a five-year mm -hmm. rule, and you don't want to wait till you're retiring and doing a Roth rollover and then suddenly having to start the count mm -hmm. for the five years. Mm -hmm. So if you have an IRA, outside of your company plan, see, talk to your accountant about doing a partial rollover mm -hmm. even into a Roth, or if you um, are of the income level that you qualify, start a small Roth, mm -hmm. just so that you have that for five years before you retire and do your rollover. Mm -hmm. Beyond the 401k, the next vehicle obviously is the IRA. And many people make the mistake of saying, oh, I can't contribute to an IRA because it's not deductible. Mm -hmm. Deductibility is not a requirement to have an IRA. And an after-tax contribution to an IRA gives you benefits either when you retire and you're taking the required minimum distribution mm -hmm. or when you get to do your Roth conversion. So money put in, tax deductible or not, that grows tax deferred mm -hmm. and through a conversion could possibly come out tax free mm -hmm. is about as tax efficient as you can get. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, if you have children that you plan to educate beyond high school, I don't care if it's trade school, I don't care if it's to go to um, beauty school or to go to community college or college, 529 plan. You put the money in, it grows mm -hmm. tax deferred. If it's used for education, it comes out mm -hmm. tax-free. Talk to your accountant. Some states give you tax benefits if you contribute to a five, yeah. 529. Seems to be a lot, a lot of options, and I guess another one uh, I've heard, uh, be cautious about buying or a tax-exempt uh, security in an, and having it in an IRA or a 401 because you don't get any benefit out of it. You can't, you can't double, double up. No double dipping. <laughs> so, and so the, I think the best advice is, contact your financial advisor, your, your accountant, somebody that really is uh, experienced in, in the field. Correct. Yes, Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Pat. Very, very good advice. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. We have a, uh, a very professional, uh, highly experienced um, uh, guest this evening, Vahan Janjigian, who is uh, with Greenwich Wealth Management. He's the Chief Investment Officer, I understand. Yes. And uh, been uh, published and seen on various uh, media. So Greenwich, Connecticut is where he's based, but he's traveled uh, here this evening to um, share us, uh, with us some of his perspectives. Welcome. Thank you very much. So looking at um, some of your activities, um, you follow the economy. I do, yes. What is your outlook on the economy these days? Well, um, I'd say good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that the U.S. economy is doing better than most other economies. Um, it's growing. Uh, unlike places like uh, Europe, for example, many countries in Europe are actually in recession. Um, the bad news, however, is that I, uh, I expect uh, 
economic growth in the United States to remain uh, very anemic. By that I mean uh, two to two and a half percent mm -hmm. uh, growth in GDP. And I have some concerns about uh, the U.S. economy, uh, most notably the employment market. Yeah. We've been hearing a lot lately about how the job market is improving, the unemployment rate has been coming down, um, non-farm payrolls have been going up. But when you look uh, into the numbers very carefully, what you see is that there is a uh, structural change taking place. Um, we have, for example, very different kinds of jobs than we did before the financial crisis. Um, we've pretty much traded the higher paying jobs for lower paying jobs. So many of these jobs that are being created today are in the lower wage categories. Mm -hmm. We have a very large number of people working part time out of necessity because they can't find uh, full time jobs. And we have a uh, civilian participation rate that's at the lowest level it's been since the 1970s. Now you would expect the participation rate to decrease if you have uh, an increasing number of people retiring. But that only explains approximately half of the decline in the participation rate. There's something else going on where people are simply no longer working at the same rates that they used to, many times because they can't find uh, jobs that they think are worth taking. So uh, because of, primarily because of what's going on in the jobs market, I'm very concerned about uh, economic growth for the uh, foreseeable future. Well, given that and the fact that we've seen the S&P 500 nearly triple mm -hmm. since March of 2009, in the middle of this extremely struggling economy. How do you account for all this bullishness in the market when the economy is lackluster at best? Well, Pat, as you pointed out earlier, um, corporate earnings have actually been pretty good. Um, however, the, the reason they've been pretty good is primarily because of cost cutting and not because of revenue growth. So there has been some, some earnings growth, which is certainly good. But I think the main reason why the stock market has done so well is because of uh, Federal Reserve policy. The Fed pretty much said to investors that, look, if you're going to keep your money in the bank, we're going to punish you. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure interest rates are so low that you won't earn anything. And by doing this, the Fed has pretty much pushed people into riskier assets, such as stocks. And uh, because there were no alternatives, in fact, there's a great acronym on Wall Street, uh, TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative to stocks. Uh, people have been going into stocks, primarily institutions have been going into stocks, um, because stocks provide a much higher return. Uh, many stocks yield dividends that are well above the uh, treasury rates. Yes. So uh, because of the uh, conditions that the Fed has created, investors have had no choice but to buy stocks. This has rewarded investors, it's punished savers, and uh, as we know, the, uh, the gap between the rich and the poor has increased during this period because it's primarily wealthier people who are willing to take the risks of investing in the stock market. Yeah. Just a general question, um, talk about the, the Fed's policies and all. To what extent do you think the Fed ha it has the ability, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in the long run, of actually manipulating the economy or even parts of the economy? Well, I mean, Federal Reserve policy certainly does uh, affect the economy. So by reducing interest rates, uh, the Fed can certainly spur economic growth. But that's only one, one tool, and it's, it's not a very effective tool. A, a much more effective tool would be fiscal policy, which the Fed has no control over. However, uh, fiscal policy requires the cooperation of, give, give of Congress. Give us an example of fiscal policy for our viewers. Well, for example, fiscal policy refers to uh, spending and taxation. Uh, one way to spur economic growth is to reduce taxes, or reduce tax rates, I should say, not mm -hmm. taxes, reduce tax rates, and perhaps increase government spending. I'm in favor of increased government spending on certain things like infrastructure projects, because those are things that we need anyway, mm -hmm. and that really helps employment and spurs economic growth. I'm also in favor of cutting tax rates. Um, don't confuse cutting tax rates with cutting tax revenues, however, however, because we've seen many times in history that when you cut tax rates, revenues actually go oh. up. Mm -hmm. So um, Congress, however, uh, because it's so divided, will not agree on a, on a fiscal policy that would ha help the economy. So as a result, the Fed felt that it had no choice but to uh, use monetary policy. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I understand Greenwich Wealth Management now manages over two billion in well, investment assets. Close to two billion. We're close. not we're not over it yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when it comes to managing your clients' investment portfolios. What have you seen as the biggest challenge in the last few years? Uh, well, it relates to what we were just talking about. Um, I have many clients who want income, and it's very difficult to generate income when interest rates are so low. So, so our biggest challenge has been generating income for those kinds of clients. Um, we haven't been able to rely on the traditional vehicles, such as bonds, because, because interest rates have been so low. So what we've done is we've been looking for alternatives and one alternative has been dividend paying stocks so we have invested very heavily in dividend paying stocks we have also invested in things like um, master limited partnerships and real estate investment trusts and, and they've done pretty well for us and generated income but it is a challenge mm -hmm. definitely do you steer your uh, clients into uh, alternative investments, uh, private equity, uh, venture capital, things of that ilk? We don't. One, one thing we don't do is we don't use third-party managers. We, we manage everything in-house ourselves. So we will invest only um, in things like exchange-traded funds and individual stocks. So we basically take an approach that we believe that uh, the portfolio should be diversified and we use the exchange traded funds to get the diversification both to the broader market, to international, uh, to even things like commodities, for example. However, uh, we also take a concentrated approach by uh, including individual stocks in their portfolios, typically no more than about 15 to 20 individual stocks. Hmm. Well, you published something called the Money Masters Stock Report. Yes, I do. And uh, the Holbert International, or Interactive, Interactive I'm sorry, yeah. has uh, voted your company number one in stock picking. Well, yeah, Holbert Interactive is a company that uh, tracks the performance of investment newsletters. And uh, Holbert identified me as the number one stock picker for the 10 years that ended in uh, 2012 with an annualized return of 18%. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you, thank you. So uh, my investment newsletter uh, recommends one stock per month um, and it's available at my website, uh, janjig.com, J-A-N-J-I-G.com. Well, would you fill us in on some of your secrets for your <laughs> stock picking? Well, what I do is I use um, a discounted cash flow approach. Um, you know, I, I used to be a finance professor, so I believe that the only uh, correct way to determine what anything is worth is to use a discounted cash flow approach. So I use a very conservative discounted cash flow approach. So for example, if I believe that a corporation's revenues can grow 5% annually, I'll model only 2 or 3%. If I believe the operating profit margin is around 20%, I'll model only maybe 17 or 18%. So I want to be very conservative with my assumptions. And then I will only invest in stocks whose market values are below the intrinsic value that I derive through my model. Excellent. So what approach is that called? Is that called the uh, value approach or? Uh well, that's a good question. I call it the undervalued approach. Okay. Uh, <coughs> you know, value managers typically focus on stocks that have low price multiples. Mm -hmm. uh, growth managers typically focus on stocks that have higher price multiples because they have higher growth rates. Uh, I focus on stocks that are undervalued. I don't care whether they're value stocks or growth stocks, as long as they're selling for less than they're worth. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been doing an awful lot of discussing of geopolitical events here tonight. Um, do you bring in geopolitical thoughts in your stock picking? You know, is, how much of an influence does that have? Well, I pay very close attention to geopolitical events. However, I'm a bottom-up stock picker, so I don't really uh, bother myself too much about what's going on geopolitically when it comes to the stock picking. I'm only interested in buying stocks that are undervalued. However, geopolitical events can certainly affect certain sectors of the economy, and as a result, I may shy away from certain sectors that I think might be negatively impacted by these geopolitical events. But I, I pay very close attention to things like, uh, for example, the crisis between Russia and Ukraine, uh, because uh, it has the, um, the uh, potential of really affecting uh, global economic growth. Uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, the United States and Europe are in a trade war right now with Russia, and that could certainly affect uh, global growth. Definitely. There's been a lot of talk about um, so-called tax uh, inversions. Oh, yes. Do you think Congress should uh, get involved and 
pass legislation to keep prevent U.S. companies from doing such things? Uh, I definitely don't think Congress should pass legislation to prevent companies from doing tax inversions, but I think Congress should certainly pass legislation to give companies the incentive to stay in the United States. Uh, those are two different things. Tax inversions, I think, to a large extent are uh, uh, misunderstood. Maybe we should give an example for the, our viewers of what we're talking about. It's, just kind of, it's kind of jargon. Yeah, I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, one of, uh, well, first, first of all, President Obama recently accused corporations of being uh, unpatriotic mm -hmm. if they were to do a tax inversion. But one of his biggest supporters, uh, Warren Buffett, is now financing the tax inversion, inversion of Burger King. Burger King wants to buy Tim Hortons, which is a Canadian company. Oh. Um, however, there is a misconception. When a U.S. company does a tax inversion, they do move their headquarters to another country, but that doesn't mean they don't pay U.S. taxes anymore. They still have to pay taxes on the income that they earn in the United States. Yeah. Okay. The problem is that uh, the United States not only has the highest corporate income tax in the world, it also taxes corporations for the profits that they earn in other countries mm -hmm. Correct. if they repatriate those profits. So for example, uh, one company that's a darling of the Democrats is, uh, is Apple. Apple is uh, very popular with Democrats. You know, Al Gore is on the board of directors at Apple. Um, Apple has $111 billion of unrepatriated corporate profits that they're keeping in other countries and investing abroad because if you read their 10K, they say if we were to bring this money back, we would be hit with a tax penalty. Give, so, give me an example, or just an estimate, would that be 10%, 20%? Oh, no, no, much higher. It's 35%. 35, yeah. so yes. a billion dollars turns that, it gets down to 700 million, 300 million Correct. to sort of Correct. go on. Now there have been, in the past, there have been tax holidays. So for example, Congress has said to these corporations, if you repatriate your uh, profits within the next 12 months, you won't have to pay the tax or you pay the tax at a much lower rate. Mm -hmm. I think there is a desire on the part of a lot of politicians, Democrats and Republicans, to either do away with this repatriation tax or to reduce it significantly. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be any tendency on the part of these politicians to cooperate with each other. But I think eventually it, it's going to get done. All right. Well, Vaughn, thank you very much. We're running out of time. Uh, it's thank been you. very, very educational. Um, we've covered an awful lot of ground. And uh, thank you again for coming. And, and Pat, thanks, thanks for the, uh, the good conversation and, and discussion. And uh, to our viewers, just remember that your money matters. Mm -hmm.